One of the biggest obstacles many people have to understanding and pursuing God's holiness is the mistaken thought that holiness and love are incompatible. Now, as I've been defining God's holiness, that God is wholly unique, that is, there is nobody like God, and that God is wholly perfect and pure in all of his attributes and actions, many people have the idea that God's perfect holiness excludes people from God's love that a person's sinfulness automatically means that somehow God hates them. Many people look to the Old Testament, to God's law, to the accounts of God's judgment upon individuals and nations and even the whole world because of their sinfulness. And they reason that the God of the Old Testament is solely an angry God of judgment who is nothing like the God of the New Testament about whom the Apostle John writes in 1 John 4, verse 16, We know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. Now, to be honest, that's one of the reasons why this series of messages from Leviticus has been fairly difficult for me to prepare and to preach. Many folks reduce the Old Testament to law and judgment, And with Leviticus starting with seven chapters just about sacrifice and then leading to another chapter focused on the death of two of the first priests because they didn't offer the sacrifices in the right way or with the right attitude, perhaps it's understandable that most folks don't think much about love in Leviticus. However, if we go back to the first sermon in the series, which I preached from a few verses at the end of Leviticus, we ought to remember that it's God's love for people, sinful people, that led him to establish a system of laws, rituals, and sacrifices through which holy God could have a relationship with sinful people. I began this series where God said to Israel in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 through 13, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you, and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke, and enabled you to walk with heads held high. Even though there is a huge gap, between God and his people because of his holiness and because of our sinfulness, because of his love, God has made a way for sinful people to have a relationship with him. That's why God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt. And God tells them that later in their history, just as he's about to lead them into the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, God tells Israel, it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The starting point of Israel's history as a nation is in God's love for them. And it continues through even the law and its regulations, its sacrifices, as we find them in Leviticus. Through the law, God established an expectation for his people to be holy as he is holy. And even though they cannot make themselves holy through the law, God makes atonement for them. He makes them holy if they will only trust him and obey him. And this is not only how God demonstrates his ongoing love for his people, it's also another way that God's sinful people can live in everyday holiness. Living by love, that is, by loving others, as God has already loved them. And I think this is what we find in Leviticus chapter 19. Many folks refer to Leviticus chapter 17 through 25 as the holiness uh, code, the place where God lays out the guidelines by which Israel is supposed to live their everyday lives according to God's expectation of holiness. And among those expectations is for Israel to just stop living like the rest of the nations of the world around them. I think this is most clear in chapters 18 through 20, where God begins in chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. The Lord spoke to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. 
do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. Through the rest of chapter 18, God forbids many different sexual relations that were common among the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And then in chapter 20, God warns Israel about the consequences for committing those sins and others, such as sacrificing their children to false gods and cursing their parents and committing adultery. And the consequences for those sins were either death or being cut off from the people. Now between these two chapters dealing with the sins of the nation and their consequences, chapter 19, God gives Israel guidelines for living differently from the nations around them. And again, God reminds Israel that his primary expectation for his people is holiness. He says in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19 verses 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then throughout Leviticus 19, we find various laws and regulations that are basically daily practical applications of the Ten Commandments, which were meant to lead Israel in everyday holiness. But there are two statements that stand out among the rest. The first is found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where God says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The second is found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Essentially, between these two commandments, God tells Israel that in order for them to be holy as he is holy, they must love other people. Here among the commands intended to set Israel apart from the nations around them, God tells Israel to be holy by imitating his love. Where the first half of Leviticus focuses on how God would make them acceptable to himself by making atonement for their sins through acceptable sacrifices, the second half of the book focuses on how they might live their everyday lives reflecting God's holiness. And so in chapter 19, God tells them they must be holy by imitating his love, by loving others as he's already loved them. Now, we already know that God initiated this relationship with Israel by rescuing them from slavery in Egypt because he loved them. And so God's love is clearly an expression of God's holiness. So as God commands Israel to be holy as he is holy, his commands for them to love not only their neighbors, but even the aliens living among them, well, these are practical expressions of God's holiness in their everyday lives, which will set them apart from the nations around them. And as we examine God's commands to love others, we also learn how to live in everyday holiness through living by love for others. Now, since this is a matter of holiness, living by love begins by rejecting worldly standards. Where in chapters 18 and 20, God warned Israel not to follow the practices of the nations around them. Here in chapter 19, God gave Israel another standard of practice, himself. Throughout chapter 19, as God restates or explains or applies one of the Ten Commandments, he punctuates each command with the statement, I am the Lord. For example, verse 3, God says, Each of you must respect his mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. And in verse 12, God says, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Whether the command is for them to respect others or to take care of others, or not to harm others, God is the standard. Not hate, but love. Not oppression, but love. And in these statements where God says, I am the Lord, he reminds Israel of his identity, his power, and his authority. 
his holiness and his love that he had already shown them when he rescued them from Egypt. As we also consider how we might live in everyday holiness, living by love, we must also remember that God is the standard by which we must define love and evaluate our actions in love. Unfortunately, the world today, as in any other age, it uses itself as the standard. And so we have standards and practices, even laws, that define love in ways that God does not. Like we can see even today in the conditions of marriage and sex and dysfunctional families and other relationships in which we find the world behaving in ways that are not according to God's standards. Now certainly if we're going to live in everyday holiness distinct from the world, we need to know and understand and follow and model God's standards for loving others. In establishing himself as the standard for holiness expressed in love, God leads his people to pursue common wholeness. That is, to pursue not just common good for individuals, but common good for the community. We need to remember that God rescued Israel and is now establishing them as a holy nation, a community set apart from others. Through these laws, established upon God's own holiness as the standard, Israel was being led to reject worldly attitudes and actions that tend to break apart individual relationships and families and communities and nations. This holiness code is not simply a checklist for individuals to follow, but a whole new holy way of living meant to form a holy community. I think we can see this in commands like we find in verses 9 and 10. God says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And then in verse 16, God tells them, Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. And more dramatically, we find in verse 29 a statement like, Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will turn to prostitution and be filled with wickedness. While God intended to set his people apart from the nations around them, he also intended for his people to live in the world in holiness so that they would bring wholeness, not only to themselves, but also to the people around them. I think this seems to be God's motivation, even when Israel was in exile in Babylon. We read in Jeremiah 29, verse 7, God tells them, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And Paul reminds the church of this as well in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, that request, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. As God commands his people to love one another, he desires not only for them to live in holiness for their own sake, but to pursue common wholeness for the sake of others, for the sake of the community. This is living by love in everyday holiness. And when we love our neighbors as ourselves, we're seeking their good as well as our own. We work together for the good of our community, our nation, and our world so that we all might live in a safe and healthy environment by God's standards and not our own. I think this is why of all the people in the world, God's people should be leading the way in our communities and in governments for the good of all people, certainly pursuing God's standards, but seeking and maintaining peace in the process. Paul tells the church this in Romans 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
even though the world may resist our efforts to promote God's standards for the benefit of all, we must not undermine God's reputation by being hostile people, by being unloving people. We must live by everyday holiness, living by love for common wholeness. Also, in establishing himself as the standard for holiness expressed in love, God leads his people to practice justice. God commanded Israel to treat other people according to his holiness, which includes both his righteousness and his mercy. In dealing with sin and oppression among other people, God commanded Israel to apply his standards of right and wrong to their interactions with others. Practicing justice means to do what is right by God's standards, and it means to make right according to God's standards when wrong is done. We can see this in commands in chapter 19, like verse 13, where God says, Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. And in verse 15, Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. And then in verse 33, When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. Now I understand that this might not be politically correct in some circles, but let's understand that those circles are the world's circles, not God's. God's people tried to play that kind of political game in Jesus' day, like when the so-called expert in the law tried to test Jesus in Luke 10, verse 29, where it says that he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story that made one of those people a half-breed, an alien, a sinner, a Samaritan, made them the hero, the one who actually demonstrated God's holiness and love when those who thought of themselves as God's people wouldn't. The simple fact is this. God's people who live in everyday holiness, living by love, practice justice. That means not only doing what is right in this moment, but making right what was done wrong in a past moment for the sake of the future. And this should help us understand that everyday holiness, that living by love means we need to show mercy. The key here is that God's commands to love others didn't stop with Israel's neighbors, other Israelites, their kinsmen. It was extended to the aliens living among them. God says in verse 34, the alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God commanded Israel to love the foreigners among them as they loved themselves because they were once foreigners in Egypt. More than that, God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And God says so in verse 36. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. God led Israel to reveal God's mercy because they had received God's mercy. And it's here we start to see God fulfilling his promise to Abraham from Genesis 12 verses 2 and 3. Where God promised, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Not only has God begun making a nation from God's or Abraham's descendants, but he has also begun blessing all peoples on earth through them. When God commanded Israel to love the aliens among them as themselves, those people began to experience God's blessing through God's people. And that's where we start to see the gospel in this part of Leviticus. When God told his people to love the aliens among them, he was preparing Israel for Jesus, who fulfilled God's promise to Abraham to bless all peoples on earth through his descendants. 
And Jesus amplified God's command here to love the aliens among them, uh, saying in Luke 6, verse 35, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Now Israel should have understood that God is kind and uh, kind to the ungrateful and wicked because he'd already shown mercy to them, not only rescuing them from slavery in Egypt, but also not destroying them in the wilderness when they were ungrateful and wicked, when they were rebelling against God after he had already rescued them. Even though God had set Israel apart from the nations of the world, they were still acting like those nations. But God showed them mercy. And so he commanded Israel to show the same kind of mercy to those who were outside of Israel, those who were outside of the promise, so that they might be blessed by God, by his mercy. And isn't that the gospel? the the good news about God's mercy for sinful people so that we might live with him and he with us and and it comes out and this comes out of God's love for us through Jesus Paul explains the good news like this in Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 7 he writes as for you you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The bad news is that like those aliens who are living there uh, among Israel, we are separated from God by our sins. But the good news is this, because of God's holiness, because of God's love and mercy, we can receive God's blessing through Jesus. And that comes by putting our faith in Jesus, who has already done the hard work of making atonement for our sins through the sacrifices of his own body and blood for our sake. Jesus makes that promise to all who believe this good news and who respond to the good news. In Mark 16, verse 16, he said, whoever believes it and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. If you'd like to receive that blessing, to be uh, forgiven of your sins, to be saved from God's judgment and eternal spiritual death, to live with God beginning right now and into eternity, then I invite you to put your faith in Jesus right away. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life, and if you'll repent, turning away from your life of sin and turning back to God, if you'll confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and if you'll join with him by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll be forgiven. And God himself, the Holy Spirit, will come and live within you to help you live in everyday holiness, living by his love along with his family, the church, as we grow together, as we work together, until Jesus returns. Now, if you're ready to make that decision, or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we can sit down and work through it all as soon as possible. But until then, I'm going to be praying for you. Father God, I praise you for your holiness and for your love.
God, I'm thankful that you love us despite our sin and that because you love us, you've made it possible for us to have a relationship with you. Right now, Father, I pray for those who have not yet put their faith in you through Jesus. And I, and I pray that your people, the church, that we would be able to, to show that love, that the people around us would witness and experience your love among us and through us. I pray that you will lead them to yourself by your Holy Spirit and through your word so that they might find your love through Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen.